Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Vera Pektileva. Vera Pektileva was born on September 24, 1997 in Kelos, Kovo Oblast. As she grew up, she became a cheerful and creative individual. With a passion for singing, she secured first place in various school competitions. Although her parents, Oksana and Yvonne, divorced during her school years, they remained on good terms. Vera maintained a positive relationship with both her father's new wife and her mother's new husband. Those who knew her described Vera as a kind, optimistic, and non-confrontational person. As mentioned earlier, Vera was a creative individual, and her family was taken aback when, after completing high school, she opted to move to Kovo and pursue a technical education at the State University, rather than following a more artistic route. Her mother, Oksana, resided in Kisilov, which was approximately 110 miles away from Kovo, and Vera would visit her during her spare time. During one of her visits in 2016, Vera encountered Vladislav Kanyus, a young man of her age. Unlike Vera, Vlad, as he was commonly known, was a complete contrast. He did not have life goals, was introverted, and had a quick temper. Having dropped out of school after the ninth grade, Vlad grew up in a troubled home. After his mother abandoned the family, he was left to live with his father. Unfortunately, his life was filled with more challenges. His father had frequent run-ins with the law, which ultimately culminated in him taking his own life in front of Vlad, leaving an indelible mark on him. Vera fell in love with Vlad despite having little in common with him. However, her parents were against their relationship, knowing Vlad's troubled past. Vera's father discovered her relationship with Vlad, and he asked her to end it. Instead of breaking up with Vlad, Vera just stopped discussing him with her parents. Vlad was never present at family gatherings, and his pictures were not posted on Vera's social media. It seemed as though Vera was keeping him a secret, according to Oksana, Vera's mother. One important detail is worth noting. In 2019, Vera and Vlad began cohabiting in Kovo. Vera's parents financially assisted with the apartment, and Vlad, who was unemployed by choice, thoroughly enjoyed living with Vera, who was not only beautiful and intelligent, but also financially secure. She consistently had money and supported him. However, their relationship was strained. Vlad struggled with alcohol addiction and showed no inclination to seek help or change his behavior. Her parents were convinced that Vlad was abusive to her. After years of suffering, Vera made the brave decision to end the toxic relationship in November 2019. However, Vlad refused to accept this and disputed her choice. As her parents had financially supported the couple's apartment, Vera reasonably expected Vlad to vacate the premises. But Vlad was unwilling to give up the benefits of living off someone else's generosity. Now here's an excerpt from Vlad's testimony. It will give you a more accurate idea of what happened after Vera decided to end her relationship with him. But remember, this is Vlad's testimony, so it's up to you whether you believe his words. On December 15, 2019, a fight broke out between him and Vera over his desire to visit a nightclub, which she opposed. This was not their first disagreement. Throughout their relationship, Vera had been frequently visiting Selos and drifting away from him. She even confessed to speaking with another person. In fact, she had ended her relationship with Vlad a month prior. He later discovered from a mutual friend that she was involved with Alexander, a resident of Selos. Although he had never met Alexander, when he confronted Vera, she acknowledged the relationship. At the time, they continued to cohabitate, but following their December 15 altercation, she left, taking some belongings with her. Despite their separation, they remained in contact by phone, and on January 12, 2020, he offered to assist her in relocating her remaining belongings to a new apartment. She agreed to meet him, and they scheduled a time for January 13. They met in the afternoon, packed up both her belongings and his, since he too wanted to move out, and drank beer, lure, and vodka. They got drunk, but there was no conflict until he brought up the topic of their relationship and revealed that he knew about Alexander. 
She became enraged, swearing at him, insulting him, and starting to physically assault him, kicking him at least five times in the groin area and slapping him in the face at least eight times. He only felt pain from the kicks, not the slaps. Vera instigated the physical fight, which made him angry because she had lied about not seeing another guy and was upset that he knew about her personal life. That was the testimony that Vlad told the police. Next, we'll discuss the other side of this story, which gives every reason to believe that Vlad was not honest in his testimony. Vera sent a voice message to her friend at 5.08 p.m. In the message, she mentioned that she was already at the apartment, packing her belongings. She expected to be settled into her new apartment around 6 p.m. and requested her friend's help to move her things from the taxi to the apartment. Just three minutes later, Vera sent a new voice message. She invited her friend to come to the apartment where she lived with Vlad and help her with the move. However, Vera did not have time to finish as Vlad intervened by saying, no, no one's coming in here. So he was against Vera's friend coming to the apartment. It seems that the situation began to get out of control because four minutes later at 5.15 p.m., Vera, in a low voice, asked her friend to come. It looks like this message was a call for help. She deliberately spoke in a low voice so that Vlad wouldn't hear her. At 5.25 p.m., Vera sends another voice message and Vlad's dominant voice is heard again. He tells Vera's friend not to bother them and to wait for Vera to text her. At 7.19 p.m., Vlad recorded the voice message himself. From that moment on, Vera did not have access to her phone. She was left alone with the monster. But what happened next needs to be explained. At about 3 a.m., the neighbors from the same floor started waking up from the terrible screams coming from apartment 738. A witness called what was happening a massacre. The screams were so loud that 15 people gathered in the hallway near the apartment. Vlad's brother was among them, and he remembered Vlad's words and realized they needed to break down the door, since his brother had previously said that he would take Vera's life. The door to the apartment was made of iron, so the neighbors started looking for tools to force it open. All this time, Vera's heart-rending cries were coming from the apartment. People called the emergency service, and these calls eventually became part of a separate investigation. For 30 minutes, the police still weren't at the scene. It lasted until 6.30 a.m. During these three and a half hours, people called the police, but no one came to Vera's aid. The witnesses made seven calls to the emergency service while Vera was fighting for her life but no one came. The last words they heard from behind the door were Vlad's. He said, Vera, forgive me. I love you very much. In the end, the neighbors found a crowbar in a nearby parking lot and broke down the door. By this time, Vera was already dead and Vlad was in the bathroom. He was very drunk. While Vera was painfully dying at the hands of her former boyfriend and the neighbors were trying in vain to get help from the police, the 112 operators were talking about life, laughing, drinking tea, and were very unhappy that they were being disturbed. The police arrived only after it became known that Vera had died. Later, they will claim that there was no gas in one car and that there were no available officers as everyone was busy with other calls. As a result, the 112 operators and the police officers on duty that night were on trial too. The video from the police station was published during the investigation, but there is no point in translating it into English. I can describe it in just one word, indifference, and it is clear even without subtitles. But Vlad claimed there were no conflicts between him and Vera until 5 a.m. However, the forensic examination showed that he lied. Vera received her first injury six hours before her death, that is, at about midnight. It meant that Vlad Kanyus was beating and injuring her for six hours until she took her last breath. Her body bore around 100 injuries, including stab wounds, a broken nose, and broken ribs. Strangulation marks were also visible on her neck. If the police's inaction shocked you, then be prepared for what comes next, which will be just as astonishing.
More than a thousand people gathered for Vera Pectaleva's funeral. The church could not accommodate everyone. According to Oksana, Vera's mother, the funeral home spent four hours trying to restore Vera's face with makeup, but she still could not recognize her daughter. That's how serious her injuries were. Meanwhile, Vlad Kanyus was telling the investigators his version of what happened. He of course tried to downplay his role in this crime. He said about that night that when he started talking to her about our relationship, he suggested they should get back together and told her that he knew she was seeing another guy. A conflict between them started. She didn't like it. After that, she started swearing, insulting him, and hitting him. Namely, she kicked him at least five times in the groin area and hit him in the face at least eight times with her palm. He didn't feel any pain when she slapped him. However, when she kicked him between the legs, he experienced physical pain. That is, Vera started hitting him first. It made him angry. He was angry that she lied and said she wasn't dating another guy. At the same time, Vera said that he was prying into her personal life because he knew everything about her. During this time, she continued to insult him, and he got angry and hit her several times with his palms, about four times on the head, but the blows were of small force. When he hit Vera, she fell to the floor, hitting the closet. She was lying on her stomach. She also hit him back, namely, she beat his head with her palms and fists. It was painful, he asked her to stop, but she didn't stop. He remembers she scratched his back. Then he decided to take her by the neck. He saw an iron that was on the floor. He took this iron and wrapped the iron cord around Vera's neck. After that, he tightened the cord around her neck slightly. He squeezed her neck for a minute and a half or two. At that moment, he didn't realize that he could kill Vera with his actions. He didn't want to kill Vera. He was tightening the cord around Vera's neck because he wanted to scare her. He wanted her to lose consciousness. He wanted her to fall asleep for 15 minutes. After he removed the cord from her neck, she started making sounds, coughing or wheezing. When he removed the cord from Vera's neck, she was in a prone position, but then he put her on her back. At that moment, she was unconscious. At the same time, she made sounds, that is, wheezed. He thought she was fine. After a while, he started waking Vera up, but she was unresponsive. Then, he started listening to whether her heart was beating. He put his ear to her mouth, then to her heart. She had no pulse, she wasn't breathing. He don't remember what happened next. He remember that at some point, he ended up in the bathroom. At the same time, he had a knife in his hands. He took a knife with me because he wanted to hurt myself. He didn't want to live because he realized that Vera was dead. He didn't want to kill her. After some time, the door to the apartment opened and his brother and a police officer were inside. After that, he was told to get dressed. He was taken to the police station. He'm sorry for what he did. He do not deny that it was his actions that caused Vera's death. He didn't want to kill her. He want to apologize to Vera's family. As you have noticed, Vlad has a selective memory. He remembered strangling Vera but did not remember how he inflicted about a hundred injuries on her. It was also unclear how Vera could have punched him in the face and scratched his back while she was lying on her stomach on the floor. During the interrogation, it also became clear how Vlad's brother ended up at the crime scene. After all, he lived in another city. Here's what Vlad told the police about it. He called his brother. He told him about what happened. He told him that Vera wasn't breathing, and his brother told me to call an ambulance and give her CPR. He tried to give her first aid. He tried to give her CPR and cardiac massage. During the investigation, it became known that he called his brother at about midnight and said that he was going to take Vera's life. At the second interrogation, when asked again about the injuries on Vera's body, he replied, it was probably me who caused those injuries to Vera. He did not count the number of his blows, but these injuries that were found on Vera's body by the expert may have been caused by me. He don't remember how many times he hit her, but he think it's the same number as indicated by the expert. He admit he caused her all the injuries indicated in the report. He wanted silence. 
he didn't think about her suffering. She screamed and insulted him during their conflict. He didn't enjoy hitting her, but he didn't like her screaming. He wanted her to shut up. He didn't think about her suffering at that time. Vlad Kanyus also said he had consensual intimate relations with Vera that evening. The related charges were eventually dropped. It was difficult to prove the opposite. Police officers and emergency service operators were charged with negligence. It's hard to believe, but they were not suspended from work during the investigation and continued to provide ridiculous justifications. The prosecutor demanded real prison terms for all five defendants, but the judge decided otherwise. They received suspended sentences ranging from 1.5 to 2 years. The court also ordered each defendant to pay around $350 to the victims. Simultaneously, the police department had to pay approximately $111,000. The amounts have been converted from the Russian ruble to US dollars for easier understanding. The indictment states that the police officers had access to gasoline and should have taken appropriate measures to resolve the situation, but they did not consider it an urgent task. Both police officers refused to cooperate with the investigation and did not admit guilt. They claimed that when witnesses reported the woman's screams and cries for help, the investigation team was at another address where a man's corpse had been found. We may never know the full truth of what happened that night. Vera was not planning to stay in the apartment and had asked her friend for help with moving, suggesting that Vlad Kanyus may have forced her to consume alcohol when she was unconscious, then fabricated a story to make the event seem unintentional. In the summer of 2022, the court sentenced Vlad Kanyus to 17 years in prison, and he partially admitted his guilt. He was also ordered to pay around $45,000 in compensation. However, this verdict shocked Vera's parents, who planned to appeal, believing the punishment was too lenient. Surprisingly, Vlad Kanyus did not even serve a full year in prison. In November 2023, Photos of him in military uniform appeared online, and in April 2023, it became known that he had received a presidential pardon after six months of participation in the ongoing armed conflict in Russia. He was also relieved of the obligation to pay any compensation to Vera's parents. Vera's case has caused widespread resonance in Russia, and the news about Vlad Kanyos' pardon has been equally controversial. The press secretary of the Russian president stated that there are specific procedures for granting pardons, including a confession of guilt by the convict and the possibility of redeeming oneself on the battlefield. Where does the line lie that once crossed, there's no return? How does an ordinary woman transform from a loving wife and beloved mother into a cruel murderer, capable of dividing a nation into two opposing groups? And how does her name become a constant topic among locals and newspaper headlines for years? Roxana Valdez could answer this question. Murderers don't stand out in a crowd, are not recognizable during dinner, and might even live under the same roof without revealing their true nature. They are indistinguishable from those who never cross that line. Thus, no one could have imagined what Roxana did on that spring evening of April 5th, 2014. And when they found out, they simply couldn't believe it. But let's start from the beginning. Little is known about Roxana's past. Despite the efforts of many Chilean reporters who competed to tell her story, they could find almost nothing about her. The only information from her criminal file was sparse. Born in a small village in the province of Punta Arenas, Chile, in 1957. That was it. Perhaps the lack of information was due to journalistic ethics, as the locals, known for their fiery temper and unique customs, might have retaliated against Roxana's relatives for her crime, potentially turning their lives into a living hell. Roxana Valdez was married to a man whose name, for reasons unknown, remains either undisclosed or unknown to the press. She had a son with him. It's clear that her marriage wasn't the dream every girl hopes for, as the couple eventually parted ways in 2011. As a single mother in a small village where jobs were scarce, Roxana faced significant challenges in such communities, the primary occupation was growing and selling fruits and vegetables. Even the local educational institutions focused on agriculture. 
It was in this setting that Roxana found employment at the Don Gregorio boarding school, which trained students to become agricultural technicians. She worked as a night supervisor at the school, ensuring that students slept at night and did not engage in unruly activities. Her responsibilities didn't include the actual upbringing of the children. Roxana's son also attended this boarding school, as she worked in the fields during the day and couldn't give him the attention he needed. At the same boarding school where Roxana worked, Claudio Munoz Ramirez held the position of head of grounds maintenance. His duties often required him to work during the night, which is how he came to meet Roxana. Despite being 14 years younger than her, they found much to talk about. Roxana would spend entire nights discussing school affairs and her own failed marriage with Claudio. They had common ground in their personal lives as well. Claudio had two daughters whom he adored, but felt disconnected from their mother, contemplating divorce several times. However, he remained in the marriage due to a promise he had made to her late father. Over time, Claudio seemingly forgot his promise and began spending his free time with Roxana away from his family. Eventually, he made a decisive move. Without explaining himself to his wife, Claudio gathered his belongings and left their home. It was clear he went to Roxana, who happily welcomed him into her life. Their relationship progressed rapidly and effectively. Roxana led into her home a man she barely knew, with whom she had only enjoyed nighttime conversations. She seemed to overlook the fact that there were children around needing constant attention. Amidst these enjoyable and heartfelt talks, Roxana failed to notice Claudio's true nature. He was, in reality, quite temperamental and sometimes even cruel. However, it was perhaps too early to judge who was more cruel between the two. The first serious outburst of aggression from Claudio took place within the walls of the boarding school. On a scheduled community cleanup day, students were assigned different areas to tidy up. Brooms, buckets, dustpans, and rags were distributed. Everything needed for a thorough cleaning. As often happens, some students protested and refused to participate. Claudio, responsible for cleanliness but lacking any teaching experience, became infuriated with these students and threatened that, in the absence of teachers at night, he would beat anyone who didn't participate. Whether he would have followed through on this threat is unknown, but the students eventually started cleaning and later collectively complained to the principal about Claudio's threats of physical violence. The principal, displeased, asked Claudio to submit a voluntary resignation. It's important to note that the Don Gregorio boarding school was practically the only place in the area offering stable and reasonably paid employment. Claudio spent some time looking for work in fields and at fruit bases, but when it became clear his efforts were in vain, he and Roxana decided to seek a better life elsewhere, leaving her son in the boarding school to continue his education. They deemed it too risky to embark on this venture with him. To avoid dependency on employers, having been burned once already, the couple decided to start their own small business, a fruit kiosk. They moved to a favorable location, the commune of Molina, a couple of hours' drive from the Chilean capital. This place is well known for its vineyards, producing renowned wine brands exported worldwide. Roxana and Claudio purchased a kiosk near their new home, found suppliers for vegetables and fruits, and made their first steps in their small family business. Claudio handled the purchasing and transportation of the products from suppliers to the kiosk, while Roxana was in charge of sales throughout the day. Hiring an employee wasn't feasible as it would mean additional expenses. Moreover, they feared that an employee might not monitor the perishable goods closely enough, leading to further losses. Claudio was visibly upset and even angry when he found out that Roxana was expecting their first child together. Perhaps it was a moment that required serious reflection, but Roxana, perhaps blinded by her new relationship and their flourishing business, didn't oppose her husband's view. She agreed that once the child was born, they would soon hand it over to her relatives for upbringing. However, it turned out there was no child to give away. Since that time, Claudio's behavior changed drastically. He often yelled at his wife and sometimes even resorted to physical violence. Neighbors from nearby houses, unhappy with their noisy new neighbors, witnessed this behavior many times and often called the Chilean police, the Carabineros, to intervene and calm the domestic disputes. On one occasion, when the Carabineros arrived in response to a call, they witnessed Roxana, in tears and almost half-naked, 
running out of the house, followed by Claudio. Roxana confessed to the officers that she was a victim of systematic domestic violence, which had led to a miscarriage. She even required psychological help after the incident. However, as time passed, the grievances were forgotten, and the troubled couple, as if nothing had happened, continued to live together as before. Following the incident, Claudio should have faced criminal charges, but a compassionate Roxana decided to give him another chance, extracting a promise that it was a one-time occurrence. Claudio vowed never to repeat such behavior, but his past actions with his ex-wife suggested his words might not hold much weight. Unfortunately, history repeated itself. Claudio temporarily ceased his physical abuse of Roxana, but developed a habit of leaving home at night to drink heavily in local bars. He spent considerable amounts of their family budget not only on alcohol, but also on local women of ill repute. Roxana endured her husband's behavior, believing that Claudio would settle down once they had a child together. In a sense, she was right. In 2013, Roxana gave birth to a healthy child. Claudio stopped his carousing and fully immersed himself in their business, which now needed to expand. They purchased another kiosk in a neighboring area and another vehicle for product transportation. Roxana also invested in firearms for protection as they lived and worked in less safe areas. The family's wealth increased significantly, but only on paper. Claudio reverted to his old ways, squandering money on drinking and again resorting to domestic violence against Roxana. In Roxana's testimony, she recounted the escalating abuse in her relationship with Claudio. Initially, Claudio's drinking was infrequent, but it soon increased in frequency. He would come home inebriated, accusing Roxana of imagined infidelities, leading to physical and sexual abuse. Despite her pregnancy, Claudio's actions seemed deliberately harmful, culminating in a miscarriage in August 2012 that plunged Roxana into a lengthy depression. One night, following his usual pattern, Claudio went out to a local bar and did not return home until the next morning. Roxana, used to his behavior, still worried about him. It turned out that Claudio had stolen 5 million Chilean pesos, about $6,000, which Roxana had from selling her mother's house to spend on alcohol and brothels. This betrayal shocked Roxana, as the money was for their shared business and was hidden in their daughter's room. When Claudio finally returned home late that evening, Roxana confronted him about the missing money. Uninterested in discussing, Claudio hit her and admitted to squandering all the money. This was the last straw for Roxana. Without a word, she went to their bedroom, retrieved a revolver intended for protection against local criminals, and shot Claudio in the chest. He died instantly, surprised by her drastic action. Roxana, equally shocked by her own actions, attempted to stem the bleeding from the fatal gunshot wound, but it was too late. The close-range shot from a .38 caliber bullet was fatal. Roxana's desperate act marked a tragic culmination of ongoing domestic turmoil. Roxana's testimony reveals her profound remorse and recognition of the immorality of her actions. She confesses that when she went for the revolver, her intention was not to intimidate Claudio but to kill him. She recalls the countless times Claudio abused and assaulted her, and her failure to report him to the authorities, or retract her complaint out of fear. She feared being alone even before they had a child together. After shooting Claudio, Roxana's immediate concern was the potential impact on their daughter, especially if Roxana were imprisoned and the child sent to an institution. That night, Roxana decided that the best way to deal with the situation was to dispose of the body and report Claudio missing. Aware that his frequent disappearances during drinking binges were known to the police, Disposing of the body was a daunting task for Roxana, a delicate woman. She decided to remove it piece by piece. First, she used kitchen knives intended for meat cutting to sever the limbs and head. This process required five knives, as they kept dulling. Then she boiled the dismembered parts in the largest pots she had, all while playing with her young daughter, who was oblivious to her mother's actions and her father's fate. Roxana's calculated approach to disposing of the body while maintaining a semblance of normalcy for her daughter, highlights the complexity and desperation of her situation. The day after cooking and cooling the body parts, Roxana packed them into plastic containers, organizing them separately, hands, legs, head, and torso. 
Each container was then placed in a garbage bag. She loaded them into her car and headed to St. Lucia to scatter the bags on a vacant lot. Before leaving, she thoroughly cleaned her house with bleach. However, once in St. Lucia, she couldn't muster the courage to dispose of the bags from her car, despite finding a suitable spot. In her testimony, Roxana expressed her internal conflict. It's strange, I had the bravery to commit this heinous crime and dismember a human body as if it were a piglet, but I couldn't bring myself to dispose of the evidence. I was nervous throughout the drive, feeling constantly watched, fearing that police would stop and search my car at any turn. This fear led to panic, even though I had a backup plan involving my daughter, pretending to rush her to the hospital if stopped. I even thought of how to pinch her to make her cry louder. Unable to discard the remains, Roxana returned home with them, hiding the bags in the garage. She cleaned her car's interior with bleach again and visited Claudio's relatives, claiming that he had stolen a large sum of money and hadn't been home for days. They merely shrugged in response. She then visited her mother and brother. Her mother was extremely worried about Roxana's behavior. She was not eating, had a glassy-eyed look, and repeatedly asked the same questions. The only question she answered promptly was about Claudio's absence, saying he went to buy goods for their store, but had a flat tire and got delayed. Returning home and alone with her thoughts and the hidden evidence, Roxana broke down. She called her brother for help. When he arrived, she confessed everything and showed him the containers. Naturally, her brother was in shock. When Roxana called her brother, she wanted to vent and share the nightmarish years she endured with Claudio. But above all, she needed his help to get rid of the containers holding the body. However, her brother refused, fearing police involvement and the possibility of being charged as an accomplice. He urged her to confess to the Carabineros, Chilean police, insisting he would do it if she didn't. Disappointed but realizing she had no other choice, Roxana complied. That night, Roxana went to the fourth police station and announced her intention to make an important statement. The officers, familiar with her, initially thought she wanted to report her troublesome husband. However, they were shocked by her confession. Roxana was immediately arrested. The news spread rapidly throughout the area, attracting countless journalists around the station. They waited eagerly to photograph Roxana as she was let out, hoping to capture a few images and, if lucky, ask her and the officers some questions. As the journalists waited, Roxana was eventually brought out. Handcuffed and in distress, she exclaimed, I was afraid he would kill me one day before being escorted into a police car. The case seemed straightforward. Roxana had confessed, provided evidence, and voluntarily surrendered. However, prosecutor Monica Ballesteros wanted a deeper investigation. Skeptical of Roxana's easy confession, she requested an extended arrest to conduct a forensic examination. Ballesteros aimed to prove that Claudio was still alive during the dismemberment, which would significantly increase Roxana's sentence. The judge granted a 60-day detention for further investigation. Meanwhile, Roxana's attorney, Carolina Gutierrez, argued that Roxana acted under extreme emotional distress, possibly exacerbated by postpartum depression and chronic domestic abuse. She emphasized Roxana's cooperation and voluntary confession as mitigating factors. However, the prosecution's theory that Claudio was alive during dismemberment crumbled after forensic results. It was confirmed that Claudio died from the gunshot wound to the chest. The bullet from the .38 caliber revolver caused a heart rupture and damaged vital organs, disproving the prosecution's initial hypothesis. Given these developments, the aggravating circumstances were dismissed. Another lawyer, Juan Pablo Cardenas, who sought to make a name for himself in this high-profile case, pointed out that the firearm used in the murder was legally registered. He also noted that Roxana's first report of domestic violence to the police was filed just 20 days after the couple started living together. Psychologist Rodrigo Valenzuela, after a medical examination, submitted documents to the court indicating that Roxana was extremely mentally unstable at the time of the crime. This meant she wasn't fully aware of her actions and her emotional instability was linked to the loss of two children, one in August 2012 and another just three weeks before the crime. Furthermore, a forensic examination requested by the prosecutor revealed that Claudio had a high blood alcohol level of three grams per liter at the time of his death. 
On April 17, 2015, after a year of various examinations, investigations, and evidence gathering, Roxana's trial began. The media, often sensationalizing tragedies, dubbed the case the Molina Cooks case, alluding to Roxana's dismemberment and boiling of her former husband. Some unscrupulous journalists seeking to attract attention to their publications even fabricated stories that Roxana had eaten part of the remains, although this was merely a product of their imagination. Roxana, aware of the media portrayal and deeply distressed by it, refused to make any statements during the trial. The prosecutors tried to influence the judge by emphasizing that Roxana committed a grave crime by Chilean standards, patricide. However, they couldn't prove that the murder was premeditated. The defense attorney, in turn, argued that his client acted in self-defense, protecting herself from a brute who had brutally mistreated her for years. The court hearing lasted several weeks, and during this time, the entire population of Chile followed the case closely. Prosecutor Monica requested a 15-year prison sentence for the accused. However, the judges, having carefully listened to the defense and the jury's opinion, sentenced Roxana to six years in a correctional facility with a lenient regime. Claudio's relatives, who understandably wished for a life sentence or even execution for Roxana, and were already protesting when they heard the prosecutor asking for only 15 years, were utterly dismayed by the actual court decision. They tried to deny any violence in the family and argued that Claudio, being a businessman and financially independent, could not have stolen $6,000 from Roxana. They also claimed that Claudio had confessed to them that Roxana often took out the revolver from the closet and told her husband that she would kill him one day. Claudio's sister, in an interview with the press, even tried to blame Chile as a state, arguing that it's a country where there is no justice and the judicial system is utterly corrupt, given that such brutal criminals are given such short sentences, comparable to minor robberies. Even Giselle, Claudio's first wife, defended her ex-husband, assuring everyone that there couldn't have been any violence from Claudio's side. She had lived with him for many years, and during all that time, he never dared to lay a finger on her. Meanwhile, Roxana often caused disputes, motivated by her jealousy and possessiveness. Regarding Roxana's subsequent imprisonment, she spent only two-thirds of her sentence in the colony before being transferred to a semi-open education center in Talca for good behavior. Roxana was allowed to communicate with her daughter and was eventually released early. The press, of course, stirred up public interest in this case again, and the public was extremely outraged that the cook from Molina was released early. However, there were also those who, although considering Roxana a murderer, still justified her actions, seeing her as a victim in the whole situation. The debate over this case continues in the country to this day. Overall, this story highlights the grave consequences that can result if domestic violence is not addressed at early stages. 18-year-old Allison Bonilla was returning home by bus when she noticed two men following her. Scared, she texted her mother and boyfriend, saying she'd run home after she got off the bus. Unfortunately, Allison never returned home that day, and it took about six months to find her. Allison Pamela Bonilla Vasquez was born on November 7, 2001, in Cartago, Costa Rica. Being the only child in the family, Allison lived with her mother, Yendry Vasquez. But Yendry wasn't the only one involved in Allison's upbringing. Allison's grandparents, Ramon and Marjorie, and Aunt Ziomara, often helped Yendry. According to Yendry, Allison's father left them immediately after she was born. He was in a relationship with another woman who was pregnant at the time. He abandoned his wife and daughter to be with her. He didn't want to be a part of Allison's life. Yendry said there was only one time when he asked to meet his daughter. He had lung cancer at the time, and that was the only reason she allowed him to meet Allison. It's worth saying that his second family didn't even know about Allison's existence until almost the whole country heard about her disappearance. Allison was very close to her mother. She considered Yendry both her mom and her dad. It may seem strange, but she always gave her mother gifts for Father's Day. Their relationship was much closer than the one between mother and daughter. They were best friends who did everything together. Allison could tell Yendry absolutely anything without fear of being misunderstood or judged. 
Allison had a large family, and although she didn't have a father, she didn't feel lonely or abandoned. She loved spending time with her family and going to church every Sunday. Relatives described Allison as a very kind, outgoing, and friendly girl. She always looked happy in the photos. There wasn't even the slightest hint of sadness or longing in her eyes. Allison has dreamed of working in the modeling business all her life. She dropped out of the eighth grade to take makeup classes because combining school with makeup classes seemed too hard. Allison didn't want to waste time on an education that couldn't help her reach her goals. She soon started looking for a job to help her mother with the bills. Yet, every time Allison would drop off her resume at places, she wouldn't get any callbacks. Yendry saw that her daughter was very depressed about this. Knowing Allison wasn't suitable for any job because of her incomplete education, Yendry advised her to attend night school. Therefore, at 18, Allison enrolled in a school, Liceo Enrique Gear Sense, located a few miles from her home. While studying at school, she received a certificate of completion of pastry courses and began making cakes. The cakes and other desserts made by Allison were just amazing. Everyone in the neighborhood was delighted with her cakes, so it became a good way for her to earn money. Allison was in a romantic relationship with Harold Segura Solano, who lived in Kachi. Kachi is a district of the Paraiso Canton in the Cartago province of Costa Rica. Allison usually spent the first half of the day at home with her mom. Later, she would meet with Harold and then go to evening school at 6 p.m. Therefore, she always returned home quite late, most often by bus. The path from the bus stop to her house ran through a quite dangerous place. It was a road with a lot of vegetation and an almost complete absence of light and people. So Allison always informed her mother of changes in her location. Sometimes, her mother even met her at a bus stop or the bridge halfway along the way. On March 4, 2020, Allison went to her mom's salon to get a manicure and chat with her. After that, she visited her friend Paola, who studied at school with her. They spent about 15 minutes at Paola's house and then went to school together. They arrived there around 6 p.m. and split up, as both were in different courses. After spending about 15 minutes in an empty classroom, Allison realized that the school had canceled her classes that day. She decided the best way to continue the evening would be to visit her aunt, who lived near the school. Her aunt wasn't home, so Allison decided to spend time with her boyfriend, Harold, before going home. However, he wasn't home. His mother said he was at work and was supposed to return soon, inviting Allison to the house to wait for him. When Harold returned, they had a big family dinner, chatting on various topics and discussing plans. After a while, Harold excused himself saying he would be back soon. He needed to leave urgently. At about 8.15 p.m., Allison left Harold's house without waiting for him to return. This moment was a start of a series of events that the whole country soon learned about. Harold returned home about five minutes later, and when he saw that Allison had left, he started texting her. He asked where she was and offered to take her home on his motorcycle. Allison immediately replied that she was already at the bus stop, so there was no need to worry. While waiting for the bus, Allison texted her friend Paula and asked if her cousin could take her home on his bike. He refused, saying his bike was a professional cycling bike unsuitable for two people. It remains unclear why she didn't ask her boyfriend for help. Perhaps she was angry with him or didn't want to bother him. As a result, Allison went home by bus. She got off the bus at about 8.43 p.m. Her home was about a mile away, Allison asked her mom to walk towards her as she had a bad feeling and was afraid. At 8.45 p.m., she texted her boyfriend and mother, saying two suspicious men were following her. They got off the bus at the same stop as her. Therefore, she decided to run home to lose them. As I have already mentioned, the road that Allison was going to run along was quite dangerous. There were almost no lights, and people rarely used it. There was only one surveillance camera there. It captured a blurry spot, which presumably was Allison. When Yendry, Allison's mom, came to the bridge half a mile from home to meet her daughter, she didn't find her. She tried to stay calm, thinking that maybe Allison had returned to the bus stop as a safety measure, but she didn't find her there either. 
Then she decided that Allison might not have noticed her and was already home. Yet, when Yendry returned home, she found the house empty. Yendry started calling the family and her daughter's friends, asking if they knew where Allison might be and inviting them to join the search. About 30 minutes later, Harold woke up to a phone call from Allison's aunt, Ziomara. She told him Allison was missing. He immediately started calling her, but it was all in vain. Her phone was unreachable. Three hours later, Allison Benilla was reported missing after her mother contacted the police. They started a search. Fortunately, Yendry knew how her daughter was dressed. As earlier, Allison had asked to take a picture of her in this outfit. Here's the last photo of Allison. At the beginning of the investigation, the police checked every place from the bus stop to Allison's house. They also examined various locations near the city, including Lake Kachi and the hydroelectric dam of the same name. On March 5, 2020, the police found the first clue, Allison's glasses. They were in the grass a mile from her house, but Allison seemed to disappear into thin air. After another eight days, they found Allison Vanilla's ID on a coffee plantation. It was strange since they already searched that entire area many times before. Another suspicious fact was that her ID was in a too perfect place, easy to notice. There wasn't any dirt on it, as if someone had deliberately put it there to mislead the investigation or hide some details. 15 days after Allison went missing, Yendry received a call from Allison's father. Instead of offering his help or sympathy, he said that Allison went missing because she was too beautiful. Yendry did not expect such soulless words, so she immediately hung up. She couldn't believe what she had just heard. Some time passed, and Allison's family, police, and volunteers continued searching for her nonstop. Every Sunday, they went outside and hung posters with Allison's photo. One day, they decided to paint messages on the street with Allison's steps from crossing to the bridge, where it's believed she got lost. They painted seven different messages, and one of them said, Allison, we're waiting for you. In addition, they put posters on poles next to the road so that those passing by could notice it. At the same time, the police got a crucial lead. A man came to the police station and said he knew Allison and had seen her the night she disappeared. According to him, on March 4th, at about 8.30 p.m., he left the house on his motorcycle to pick up someone. While he was driving, he saw Allison, and he also saw a two-door wine-colored BMW pull up next to her. He said he then turned around to see what was going on. He realized who the car belonged to. It was his cousin's BMW. It had bright yellow headlights, a distinctive feature of this vehicle. That's why he was 100% sure it was his cousin's car. In addition, another man also told police that he saw the same BMW that evening near the place where Allison disappeared. It belonged to 28-year-old Nelson Sanchez Urania, known locally as Sukia, since, according to the public, he was a member of a local gang. As it turned out, Nelson knew Allison. Their families had known each other for a long time. For a while, they even lived in the same neighborhood. Allison's mom later said she only had one interaction with him. It was just a neighborly relationship rather than a friendly one. One day, Nelson offered Allison and her cousins a ride home, to which she agreed since it was daylight. She was not alone and considered him a decent person. On March 2, 2020, two days before Allison disappeared, Nelson sent her a Facebook message asking her to answer some questions. On the advice of her cousin, Allison agreed. Nelson then asked Allison how she felt about him. He wanted to know if Allison liked him. Allison was puzzled, as she did not understand the meaning of such a question. They weren't friends, and they hardly knew each other. When Allison asked Nelson why he was asking this, he replied, It's because I don't think bad of you, but I just wanted to ask you if you thought bad of me. Allison replied that she didn't dislike him assuring him everything was fine between them. Nelson thanked her and said goodbye. On March 26, 2020, detectives obtained a warrant to search the house and confiscate Nelson Sanchez Urania's car, mobile phone, and computer. His phone contained some very disturbing things. There were a lot of pictures saved on his phone showing the abuse of women. During the search of his car, the police noted the perfect cleanliness in it. As it turned out, Someone cleaned the carpet and seats with polishing liquid. 
Yet, the front carpet of the driver's seat and the trunk carpet were missing. The police found hair and drops of blood on the trunk lid and sent it to the laboratory for analysis. After completing the visual inspection of the car, the police conducted a test with a service dog. It showed possible traces of blood on the two front seats and in the trunk of the vehicle. The luminol exam confirmed it. It's a chemical that reacts with hemoglobin in blood cells. Traces of blood, which the owner tried to destroy with cleaning products, were found in many places in the car interior. While the detectives were waiting for the results from the lab, Nelson Sanchez Urania was a free man, but he was under surveillance. They monitored his every move to ensure he did not leave the city or the country. Yendry insisted that the investigators arrest him, but the police had no grounds for this yet, so he remained at large for several months. Yendry thought someone kidnapped Allison to later ask for a monetary reward for her return. She tried to stay calm and not panic. She hoped her daughter was still alive. She left Allison's room untouched. She didn't make the bed. She didn't rearrange things. She also bought gifts for her daughter in case she returned home. I will continue to do this because until I see anything that proves that she is dead, my daughter is alive and will return home, she told reporters. On September 2, 2020, detectives finally received results from the laboratory, confirming that the hair and blood found in Nelson Sanchez Urania's car belonged to Allison. The police arrested him on the same day. Later, Urania's ex-girlfriend told the police that he had never physically harmed her, but there was a lot of moral pressure in their relationship. He did not allow her to communicate with friends or use the internet. According to her, he only wanted an intimate relationship with her. Urania's former boss said he treated his work irresponsibly and once even stole about $1,000. In addition, they interviewed his landlord, who said that one of Urania's ex-girlfriends left him because she was tired of paying his bills. She called him a very spoiled man. On September 4th, Nelson Sanchez Urania confessed what he had done to Allison Bonilla. According to him, on the night Allison disappeared, driving by, he saw her alone, walking along an empty road. He decided to take advantage of the fact that it was late at night. Nelson realized Allison would not be afraid to get into his car because she knew him. He offered to give her a ride, to which she agreed and got into the car. But instead of going home, he turned the other way and took her to a coffee plantation, where he forced her to get out of the car. Nelson hit her so hard that her glasses fell off and she almost fainted. After that, he took her to a nearby abandoned house where he had intercourse with her against her will and then severely beat her. Urania then took her to the front seat of his car to tie her hands with some cloth and duct tape. Then, Urania put her in the trunk and drove to a landfill in San Geronimo Cachi. There, he threw Allison off a cliff into a pile of garbage. He explained his actions by using too many illegal substances. He said he was heavily under their influence. He also explained that he was obsessed with Allison. According to him, when he saw her that night, he knew that this was the right moment to realize his obscene fantasies. As is often the case in such stories, Nelson Sanchez Urimia later retracted his confession, saying that the police had put pressure on him, but there was enough evidence against him to bring charges. The maximum sentence he faced was 35 years. Early in the morning on September 4th, the search team went to the landfill in San Geronimo to search for Allison's body. But since the area was too vast and not easily accessible, finding Allison's remains was not an easy task. In addition, six months have passed since her disappearance. Only 25 days after Urania's confession, the police found human bones, vertebrae, ribs, part of the pelvis, a femur, fragments of clothes that Allison was wearing on the day of her disappearance, as well as one sneaker with nails inside. The police sent all these clues for examination. Jose Francisco Herrera, the suspect's lawyer, said the evidence could have been falsified because it was found by a group of volunteer rescuers, not the judicial police. In addition, Herrera said it was strange the authorities had found human remains in the area specified by Urania on the same day when his client changed his statement and said he wasn't guilty. 
Bonilla family's lawyer, Rodrigo Araya, criticized the change in the suspect's testimony, saying the incident was a mockery of the authorities' work. On October 5th, 2020, the experts confirmed that the remains found belonged to Allison Bonilla. Since the search team didn't find all parts of Allison's body, forensic experts were unable to determine the exact cause of her death. However, the expert who examined the remains concluded that numerous fractures on her body occurred after death, indicating a fall from a great height. The clothes found were torn and there were bite marks on the sneakers, so experts concluded it could have been the work of animals, and that is why the remains were in different parts of the landfill. Yendry, Allison's mom, was furious that the police hadn't listened to her and hadn't arrested Urania earlier. Maybe he would have confessed even earlier, and then Allison's body could still be intact. It was a great tragedy for the whole family. It's an unimaginable pain that I'm going through, but she's in a better place where no one will hurt her, Yendry said. The trial of Nelson Sanchez Urania began on July 19, 2021. One of the witnesses at the trial was Allison's boyfriend, Harold Segura Solano. In his statement, he said Allison was at his house with his mother when he returned from work at about 6.30 p.m. on March 4, 2020. At some point, he left for five or 10 minutes. Upon returning, Harold saw that Allison had left without saying goodbye. He kept in touch with her through text messages while she was on her way home. After she got off the bus, she informed him that two men were following her. With that in mind, Harold insisted that she should take a taxi. He said he would pay the taxi driver himself, but Allison refused twice and texted him that she would run to her house. He didn't receive any more messages from her after that. However, according to him, he informed only his mother about the situation. He didn't contact Yendry, Allison's mother. He explained that he didn't do it because his phone's battery had run out, and then he fell asleep for 30 minutes. He discovered that his girlfriend was missing from Allison's aunt, who called him. From that moment on, he said he got scared and called Allison's cell phone several times, but all calls went straight to voicemail. WhatsApp messages were also not getting through. Harold indicated that he had been part of the search team for several days, but stopped because he did not feel fit and had to work. No doubt he wanted things to be different. If he could rewind time, he would have taken Allison home that evening, but unfortunately, nothing can be changed. On August 18th, 2021, the court sentenced Nelson Sanchez Urania to 18 years in prison for taking the life of Allison Benilla. He could have received twice the sentence, but the judge pointed out that there was no evidence to confirm that Urania knew about the path and time of Allison's return home and that he planned to attack her. Moreover, due to the condition of Allison's remains, there was no evidence that Urania had forced her into intimacy. But this is not the end of the story. Allison's family was very disappointed with the verdict. In their opinion, this was not a fair punishment. In 2022, the family's lawyer filed an appeal. The court overturned Urania's sentence and scheduled a new trial. On September 28, 2023, the court sentenced Nelson Sanchez Urania to 35 years in prison. Allison's family's lawyer pointed out that Urania acted wildly, cowardly, and inhumanly and took advantage of the victim and her loved one's trust. According to the court, Urania's actions were premeditated. Allison had known Urania for several years, so he took advantage of this to commit a crime. Urania showed no remorse, and the criminal court took this into account. Despite feeling pain and anger, the family was happy with the new verdict, which finally closed this chapter of their lives, ending this nightmare that lasted more than three years. Allison's family placed a cross and laid flowers where she was found. They made for her something like a small altar with her photo and a statue of the Virgin Mary. The Allison Vanilla case has had a strong impact on Costa Rican media and social networks, even sparking several marches in memory of the young woman and other women who had previously suffered under similar circumstances, such as Maria Luisa Sedeno and Luani Salazar. A link to the story of Maria Luisa Sedeno should now appear on your screens. 
Hello friends, welcome to our channel. Today, we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. The case of Celeste Mano. Celeste Mano's story began quite harmlessly. She was receiving attention from a work colleague which she consistently ignored. She sincerely hoped that her admirer would soon understand and just leave her alone. However, one careless action by Celeste drastically changed everything, turning her suitor into an obsessed pursuer. Another thoughtless act led to irreversible consequences. Celeste Cristano was born on November 30, 1997, in the northeastern part of Melbourne in Victoria State, Australia. She was the youngest of two children to parents Eggy Dero and Tony Mano. She grew up alongside her older brother named Alessandro. According to some accounts, their father left his wife when the children were still small and soon remarried. However, he always maintained contact with his older offspring, supported them financially, and tried to be actively involved in their lives. During her school years, Celeste was quite sociable, active, and friendly. She engaged in sports and dance, served as the captain of the cheerleading team, and had big plans for her future. Initially, she dreamed of becoming a lawyer and enrolled in the prestigious University of Melbourne, studying criminal and civil law. However, towards the end of her studies, she found law dull and began studying advertising and marketing. In 2018, she was hired by a large and rapidly growing company that sold various goods on e-commerce platforms. Smart and talented, Celeste quickly grasped everything on the fly. She successfully fulfilled her duties and rapidly ascended the career ladder. From a simple call center worker, she became the head of an entire department in less than two years. Considered one of the most promising employees, everyone admired her intelligence, initiative, and ability to organize work competently. Moreover, Celeste possessed outstanding external attributes and a flawless figure. During her university years, she even participated in the university beauty contest and was among the top three leaders. She always had many admirers from a young age, but was meticulous in choosing partners. Among her colleagues was Louis Sacco. He worked at the company nearly 16 years older than her and showed a lively interest in Celeste from her first days at the office. Worth noting is that Louis Sacco was quite reserved and unsociable, evidently lacking career ambitions as he long occupied the same minor position without desire for development. Kind, smiling and open, Celeste did not want to hurt Louis Sacco's feelings, so she always politely declined whenever he tried asking her out. Despite this, Lou repeatedly attempted to draw her attention in various ways. Sometimes Celeste would make jokes to lighten the mood but firmly desired nothing to do with him. His attentions were persistent and awkwardly annoying, but keeping composure, Celeste hoped he would soon give up or shift his focus elsewhere as time passed. Louis Sacco remained relentless, becoming almost obsessed with the young beauty, Celeste Mano. Everyone around him noticed it. One day, Celeste confided in a close colleague that she wouldn't ever consider a relationship with Louis. First, he was odd and unpredictable. Second, she never felt any attraction towards men who lacked ambition and life goals. Third, the significant age gap also played a role. Nonetheless, she did pity him because despite all his efforts, he stood no chance. Unfortunately, Louis Sacco lost focus on his work in his fruitless attempts to win Celeste's attention and affection. Historically, he was a very hardworking employee, but now he completely ignored his job duties and his productivity suffered greatly. Senior management was unhappy with this drop in performance. Lewis was given three reprimands and warnings. In early autumn of 2019, the company ultimately fired him for his negligence. Louis Sacco was very upset by this turn of events. As he packed up his things at the office, it seemed he was about to cry. Celeste experienced mixed feelings. On one hand, she felt relieved that he would disappear from her life and stop bothering her with persistent overtures. But on the other hand, she felt some guilt believing his dismissal partly happened because of her. As a department manager, Celeste thanked Louis for his years of service and escorted him to the building exit. She tried to encourage him with a pat on the shoulder and sincerely wished him luck as they parted ways. However, 
It turned out this harmless act was a mistake, a catalyst that fueled Louis's belief they could make their relationship work. Instantly, Louis decided that Celeste was simply afraid to start an office romance since she was his boss and feared general disapproval or damage to her career. Now convinced nothing stood in the way of their potential happiness together, Louis, overwhelmed by his emotions, unexpectedly kissed Celeste on the cheek. An awkward pause ensued. Stunned by his audacity, Celeste didn't know how to react, so she just turned around and hurried back into the office building without saying anything. This reaction further convinced Lue that Celeste harbored feelings for him and believed he should not give up pursuing her. Just days after, Lue created a social media account, found Celeste's profile, and sent her a friend request. At first, she accepted it, thinking no harm would come of it. But when he started bombarding her with requests to meet up and go out together, she tried to decline politely. Eventually, she just blocked him. The following day, the former colleague sent another friend request from a newly created profile. Celeste tried to ignore it. However, he began commenting on her photos, praising her looks and mentioning how great they would be as a couple. She then adjusted her profile settings so only friends could send her messages or comment on her photos or posts. A week later, during a family gathering, she mentioned the persistent pursuer to her relatives. She also recounted the strange incident from the day he was fired. Her family listened but assumed it wasn't serious and that the unwanted admirer would lose interest and disappear from her life soon. Lue didn't have Celeste's personal phone number while they worked together. They only communicated through work channels. But now Celeste began receiving peculiar romantic messages from an unknown number. She quickly guessed who they were from. The admirer sent romantic poems he had written, praised her beauty again, and tried to convince her to meet up. Celeste answered his call only once in an attempt to have a serious conversation with him. She explained that nothing could happen between them and tried to persuade him to stop pursuing her. Nevertheless, he didn't listen. Instead, he just complimented how pleasant her voice was and expressed how glad he was that she had finally picked up. After this conversation, she tried blocking him again, but each time he'd call from a new number. Eventually, she decided to change her own number. Still within a week or so later, Louis managed to find it out and continued his telephone harassment. Seeking some form of protection for about half a year, Celeste kept unsuccessful attempts at ignoring the crazed admirer. She blocked his numbers and fake social media pages, but he persisted with messages and continually disrupted her usual life. The stream of messages continued, and over time, their nature shifted from romantic to bold and threatening. The man stopped asking politely. He began demanding meetings and detailing his delusional intimate fantasies about what he intended to do with her immediately. However, that wasn't the worst of it. It became evident that the stalker began following her from work to home, where she lived. Celeste didn't initially realize that Louis was now present in her life beyond just the messages. He was literally tracking her every move. She occasionally glimpsed him near her home, but convinced herself each time that it was merely a product of nerves or imagination. When she finally understood that she was not mistaken and that Louis, with his obsessive behavior, was indeed following her, she decided to seek police protection. Celeste wanted law enforcement to issue a special order prohibiting the stalker from approaching her and her home. However, the officers were indifferent, even mocking at times. According to them, writing poems or expressing explicit fantasies in text messages is neither illegal nor punishable. Since Celeste couldn't provide evidence of Louis following her and lurking near her home, they simply asked her to leave the precinct and not hinder them from catching real criminals. For another six months, Celeste continued to endure relentless harassment from her former colleague. During work days, she frequently noticed his car parked across the street from her office. In the evenings, he would drive past her house several times. She constantly felt his gaze on her, increasing her anxiety and making daily life tense. In August 2020, Celeste approached the police again. 
This time she provided photo and video evidence on her phone, showing that Lue was indeed following her. A different officer took her statement this time, an officer who took the situation more seriously and expressed surprise at his colleague's previous indifference. He advised her to immediately go to court, where a restraining order was issued against Lue. He was notified that he could no longer call, approach her, or try to contact her in any other way. Clearly, the man did not expect this turn of events and indeed disappeared from Celeste's sight for a few weeks. She was happy for the first time in a while. She felt free and believed that the harasser would no longer bother her. However, her relief was premature. Less than a month later, she began receiving messages from unknown numbers. Initially, Lue pleaded and then demanded she retract her statement and remove the restraining order, as he believed it interfered with their romantic relationship. After receiving several messages, Celeste immediately went to the police, since her pursuer had violated the restraining order. Now, he had to face the consequences. The man was fined and warned that further violations could lead to much more severe measures. If he didn't leave the young woman alone, he could end up in jail. After this incident, Lue did not make his presence known for almost two months. The young woman believed he had finally left her alone. In September 2020, Celeste met a young man named Chris Reedsdale. He was just a year older than her, and they quickly found they had many common interests, views on life and goals. Consequently, a romantic relationship soon developed between them. She told her new boyfriend about the harassment from her former admirer and confessed that although Lue had not appeared, she still felt anxious. Chris endeavored to surround his girlfriend with care and attention, doing everything to make her feel safe and worry-free. In early November, Celeste invited Chris to a family dinner to introduce him to her parents and brother. Celeste's choice was well received by her family. They quickly hit it off and her mother even jested that her daughter was now in safe hands. The following weeks passed peacefully, with no sign of the former admirer, who did not attempt to contact Celeste. The young woman found joy in spending all her free time Chris. It appeared she no longer worried about Lue possibly barging back into her life or causing her any harm. On November 15, 2020, the love-struck couple decided to go out on a date they sat in a cafe, enjoying each other's company. During this pleasant moment, the young woman suggested they capture it by taking a selfie. The photo turned out very romantic. They were sitting at the same table, embracing, smiling, and looking genuinely happy. Celeste was so fond of this picture that she decided to use it as her profile picture on social media. In doing so, she aimed to share the news of her new relationship and indicate how serious things were between them. Chris also posted the photo on his page with a touching caption about how much he loved Celeste and how he would do everything to keep her eyes sparkling with happiness as depicted in the picture. Unfortunately, this outing would be their last as a couple. On the evening of their final date, Chris dropped Celeste off at her home and they said goodbye with plans to meet again the next day. Celeste spent about an hour in the kitchen talking with her mother about her boyfriend before heading to bed, since she had to get up early for work the next morning. On Monday, November 16th, 2020, around 4 a.m., Eggy was awakened by the sound of breaking glass, but didn't immediately grasp what was happening. Then there were suspicious noises, banging, screams, and commotion followed. At first, it seemed like these noises were coming from outside on the street. However, she soon realized they were emanating from within the house. Eggy leapt out of bed, threw on a robe, and rushed to her daughter's room. She flung open the door and in the dim light saw someone literally jumping away from Celeste's bed before escaping through a broken window. When Eggy turned on the light, she was confronted with a horrifying scene. Her daughter lay in a pool of her own blood, covered in cuts and small shards of broken glass. Celeste was struggling to breathe, gasping for air. Her eyes were wide open, staring upward. 
Immediately, her mother called emergency services and tried to stem the deep bleeding wounds on her daughter's body until the paramedics arrived. Unfortunately, it was too late. By the time police doctors got there, she had already passed away. The medical examiners later found over 20 penetrating stab wounds on her body with the fatal blow aimed at her heart. During the investigation, the prime suspect was scrutinized. Analyzing the situation and comparing it with Eggie's testimony, police concluded that the assailant took less than three minutes to break into the victim's room through the window and carry out the attack before her mother entered. The suspect used a large butcher's knife striking randomly, while Celeste tried to defend herself as indicated by numerous cuts on her arms. When asked if her daughter had any enemies, Eggie could only recall one name, Lue Sacco. He had obsessively pursued the young woman for over a year, harassing her with calls and threatening messages. This information was corroborated by other family members as well as friends and colleagues. At the scene, the suspect left many bloody fingerprints and DNA was found on a fence he jumped over while fleeing since he had injured his hand. It became imperative to detain and interrogate Lue immediately as the prime suspect to verify and compare all evidence and witness statements. Lue was arrested that same day, but initially vehemently denied his involvement in the incident. He insisted that he loved Celeste and would never harm her. Forensic results later confirmed the bloody fingerprints found in the victim's room and on the fence to him. Law enforcement also highlighted the restraining order against approaching the young woman, which he had violated. Additionally, on the evening before the tragedy, it was discovered that Lue had purchased a hammer and a large knife at a local hardware store. This transaction was captured on surveillance cameras at the checkout. Lue used the hammer to break into the house through a window and then used the knife in his fatal attack on the unfortunate woman a calculated criminal or a man in need of treatment. The evidence against Sako was undeniable, further underscored by his long-term surveillance of the victim, knowing practically everything about her. The final trigger for him appeared to be a photo posted by the young woman on social media with her new boyfriend. After seeing this, he went to a store, bought a knife and hammer, and under cover of night, went to Celeste's home to end her life. His actions were seen as calculated and premeditated criminal activity. Yet Lue's behavior was quite erratic, raising questions about his mental stability. Notably, at nearly 39 years old, he had never married, continued living with his parents, had almost no friends, and never held a job for long periods. People described him as nervous and introverted with severe socialization issues. Additionally, Lue had a biological brother serving a lengthy sentence for another criminal act at that time. Following these events, a forensic psychiatric evaluation was ordered for Lue, with his attorney insisting that his client required specialized treatment instead of imprisonment. This argument angered and upset the victim's family, who feared that this cruel individual might evade punishment. After interviewing Lue and analyzing his behavior, Psychiatric experts concluded he did indeed suffer from some mental disorders. However, and it's important, they determined that at the time of the crime, he was fully aware of his actions. Furthermore, he had meticulously planned the crime in advance, carefully considering the details. As a result, despite his efforts to feign insanity, Sako would inevitably face a trial. The trial and subsequent sentencing did not occur until the autumn of 2023, three years after the tragic death of the young woman. During this period, the criminal made several attempts to demonstrate his mental illness, hoping to avoid conviction for deliberate criminal acts. He spent most of this time in a psychiatric facility. In the courtroom, Lue appeared calm and detached, showing little interest in the proceedings. Although he admitted his guilt, he maintained that his intention was not to take the girl's life, but to win her affection. However, the jury unanimously found Lue guilty on all charges. He was then sentenced to 36 years in prison, with the possibility of parole no earlier than 30 years. Celeste's law, which ultimately was not passed, 
aimed to address the fact that existing laws did not consider online stalking and phone harassment as criminal offenses. The parents of Celeste highlighted that their daughter had sought police protection as early as 2020, but her complaint was not taken seriously due to the limitations of the current legislation. Over the three-year period leading up to the trial, the mother of the deceased young woman, along with legal experts and activists, collaborated to develop Celeste's law. This law sought to establish criminal accountability for online stalking through social media platforms, text messages, and emails. The hope was that such a law would provide protection for countless women and girls, preventing similar tragedies from occurring. Despite these efforts, the investigations revealed that most online stalkers remained covert and did not attempt any direct contact with their victims. The amendments made to the legislation primarily focused on restricting access to personal information on social media platforms. In cases involving severe stalking with threats, a restraining order could be issued, similar to real-life scenarios. Nevertheless, there remained a lack of criminal accountability for such crimes. Currently, a stalker might only receive a verbal warning for their actions, and in cases of repeated violations, they could face fines, but not always. The enactment of Celeste's law, with its proposed changes, remains pending. Shafilea Ahmed was born on July 14, 1986, a British Pakistani girl. Shafilea's father, Iftikhar Ahmed, originally hailed from the Gujarat district of Pakistan. At the age of about 20 to 22, Iftikhar moved to Britain for employment. While staying there for a while and during work, Iftikhar falls in love with a foreign girl and marries her. Soon he becomes a father, but when he returns to Pakistan and informs his family about his marriage, they do not accept it. Then Iftikhar's family puts heavy pressure on him to marry another Pakistani girl. Despite Iftikhar's resistance, he eventually succumbs to his family's insistence and he marries a Pakistani girl named Farzana. After the marriage, Iftikhar returns to Britain and, after revealing the truth to his first wife, divorces her. Then, after some time, Iftikhar calls his second wife, Farzana, to Britain from Pakistan. After coming to Britain, Iftikhar starts living with his wife in the city of Bradford in West Yorkshire. It is here that on July 14, 1986, Shafilea Ahmed is born. Shortly after Shafilea's birth, the family moves to the town of Warrington in Britain. It is here that Shafalea completes her early education. During this time, two more daughters are born in the family, and Iftikhar's family grows larger. Although this family resides in Britain, on holidays, Iftikhar used to take his wife and all his children to Pakistan for vacation. Now the year had come, 2003, and by now Shafilea Ahmed had also turned 17, and was studying the law. Her dream was to become a lawyer. When Shafilea and the other children have a break on February 18, 2003, Shafilea comes to Pakistan with her family for vacation. During their trip to Pakistan, this family also participates in a family wedding ceremony. However, just a few days after this wedding, a major incident occurs with Shafilea. She accidentally drinks phenyl floor cleaner. Actually, Fennel is commonly used in Asia for cleaning floors and homes. Now, because fennel is made by mixing some chemicals and soap, drinking it causes severe pain in Shafalea's throat. The reason behind Shafalea drinking fennel is initially said to be because her parents pressured her into arranged marriage with a Pakistani boy. Because of this pressure, Shafalea drank the fennel intending to end her life. But later, her parents claimed that someone had poured fennel into an old bottle of water, kept in the same bottle usually used for drinking water, and in the darkness of the night, Shafilea mistook fennel for water and drank it. Due to this mistake, Shafilea had to endure a lot of pain. As a result, she's admitted to a hospital in Pakistan. Now, because Shafilea's injury was quite severe, she has to stay in the hospital for a long time. During this time, the holidays of other family members also end, so Iftikhar takes his two children and wife back to Britain, while Shafilea has to stay in Pakistan for treatment. However, shortly after, 
if Dukar arranges for Shafilea's return as well, and on May 27, 2003, Shafilea returns to Britain. Straight from the airport, Shafilea is admitted to a hospital for treatment through an ambulance. After several months of treatment, Shafilea's throat heals considerably, and now she rejoins college. Alongside college, she also starts a part-timing job. But on September 18, 2003, a college teacher notices that Shafilea Ahmed hasn't been coming to college for the past week. Attempts are made to contact Shafilea via phone, but she cannot be reached. When teacher asked about this to Shafilea's parents, they revealed that Shafilea has not been home for the past week. Their daughter has been missing for a week, and her parents hadn't filed any complaints about her yet, which strikes Shafilea's teacher as very strange. Immediately after this, they inform the police. Upon filing the case, a police team arrives at Shafilea's house for investigation, and questioning begins with her parents. Shafilea's parents say that they last saw Shafilea at their home on September 11, 2003, and since then, she hasn't been seen. Upon this, the police ask, when your daughter has been missing for a week, why haven't you filed a complaint with the police yet? To this, Shafilea's parents respond, this is not the first time Shafilea has been missing from home for a few days. It has happened several times before. To confirm this, when the police check the records, it is revealed that Shafilea has been missing from home several times in the past. The first time was when Shafilea was only 12 years old. She went missing with her younger sister on March 10, 1998. Because of this, her parents had also filed a missing report for both their daughters with the police. However, at that time, Shafilea returned home with her sister as evening approached. According to records, Shafilea ran away from home for the second time on November 25, 2002. Once again, her father, Iftikhar Ahmad, filed a missing report for his daughter. After extensive searching, Shafilea was found by the police sitting in a park. According to police records for the third time, Shafilea left home with a friend on February 3, 2003. This time, Shafilea did not return home for two days, and then on February 5, 2003, she went to a safe house for orphaned people and filed a report against her parents for domestic violence and mental abuse. After the report was filed, the police officer spoke with Shafilea Ahmed and her parents, and after everything was cleared up, Shafilea returned home. After this, on February 18, 2003, Shafilea, along with her two sisters and parents, goes to Pakistan for a family function and disappears from there shortly after returning to Britain. Now, looking at old records, the police also suspect that Shafilea Ahmed may have gone somewhere again this time and will return home in a few days. Therefore, the police try to find Shafilea in all those places where she could have gone. However, even after a few days, the police cannot find any trace of Shafilea from anywhere. Considering Shafilea's history of running away from home before, the police show a little laziness in the investigation this time. After this, some local media start making an issue out of the police's laziness. As a result, demand for a thorough search for Shafilea increases at the local level. Due to the progress in the Shafilea missing case, the police accelerate their investigation. Subsequently, they discover numerous poems written by Shafia at her home, and there was still no evidence in the case of Shafilea Ahmed. The police were engaged in efforts to locate Shafilea. Meanwhile, floods occurred in the famous Kent River, flowing from the Sedgwick area of Britain. When the floods were under control, the body of a girl were found in extremely poor condition on the banks of this river. The distance between the place where the body was found and where Shafalea Ahmed had disappeared was 70 miles. But still, the police have doubts whether this corpse could be Shafalea's. However, to confirm this, DNA samples are collected from the dead body and then matched with the DNA of Iftikhar and Fazan. In this case, a major twist occurs when a body washed away in the flood matches with the DNA samples of Iftikhar. This meant that the body washed away from the river was not someone else's but Shafilea Ahmed's, meaning in the search for Shafilea Ahmed, whom the police had been looking for the past year, now reaches the police itself in the form of a corpse. Now, the biggest question in front of the police was who and why murdered Shafilea Ahmed. However, 
Even before the statements and actions of Corpse's parents, there were doubts, and in 2003, these two, along with five others, were arrested. Therefore, once again, Shafilea's parents are arrested and questioned. The trial of this case is also going on, but even this time, no allegations can be proven against them, which leads the police to release them again. However, after that, the police detain some other suspects and proceed with the investigation against all of them. But despite many efforts, the police cannot reach the murderer. As time passes, people slowly start to forget about Shafilea Ahmed's case. Shafilea disappeared in 2003, and now it was 2010. That is, it had been seven years since Shafilea's death. By now, Shafilea's family had also moved on from the incident and had become busy with their daily lives. But then, on August 25, 2010, a major theft occurs at Iftikar Ahmed's house. By now, Iftikar Ahmed's family had already become the center of attention in the city due to their daughter's disappearance. Due to this, when theft occurs in this house, it starts making headlines on the front page of newspapers. But once again, this puts heavy pressure on the police. Despite working honestly, the police quickly get involved in the search for the thief. After many days of hard work, the police make a revelation that surprises everyone. Actually, the police arrest not someone else, but Imtikar Ahmed's daughter, Alicia Ahmed, on charges of theft in the house. In fact, Alicia was Shafilea's younger sister. According to Alicia, she didn't get as much money from home as she demanded and needed. Because of this, she orchestrated the theft of her father's money at her own home. However, the police had solved the theft case very quickly. But the police spot an opportunity here and now. They start talking to Alicia about her sister Shafilea, who disappeared many years ago, and reopen the file related to the Shafilea case. In the initial conversation, the police suspect that Alicia knows something about the disappearance of Shafilea that the world is still unaware of. The police officers try to uncover what happened with Shafilea, but Alicia refuses to cooperate with them. However, the police then tell Alicia, you have orchestrated a theft in your own house, which could lead to a long prison sentence for you. But if you can provide any information about Shafilea that nobody else knows, your sentence could be significantly reduced. Afterwards, when Alicia reveals some details to the police, everyone is left stunned. Alicia explains, It was not someone else but my father, Iftukar, and my mother, Farzana Ahmed, who had beaten Shafilea Ahmad in front of all of us sisters. Then our father put polythine on her face, and due to suffocation, she was dead. Then he placed Shafilea's body in his car and threw it into the distant jungle. However, due to the flood, the body drifted to the riverbank from the jungle. According to Alicia, Iftikar and Farzara did not like their daughter's modern lifestyle at all. On the surface, Shafilea started falling in love with a boy, and when this matter comes to light, Iftikar and Farzana quickly try to arrange Shafilea's marriage with their preferred boy. When the family goes to Pakistan for a family function, there is an attempt to forcefully marry Shafilea to a boy there, but Shafilea refuses to marry for this reason, and she consumes fennel. After that, her health deteriorates, and her marriage does not happen either. When Shafilea returns to Britain, her family members here also insist on arranging her marriage with a boy of their choice. But when Shafilea repeatedly refuses this marriage, her father gets angry, and at first beats Shafilea in anger and then covers her face with a polytheme bag, and then due to suffocation, Shafia Ahmad dies here. But immediately after this disclosure, Alicia Ahmed becomes a government witness in the case. In exchange, she is assured a minimum sentence in the theft case. However, based on Alicia's statement on September 2, 2010, Farzala and Iftikhar are arrested, and then a case of their own daughter's murder is pursued against them. Both of them remain in jail for several months after the arrest. However, nearly a year later, on September 15, 2011, they are granted bail by the Manchester Crown Court. In the further investigation, the police gather some crucial evidence, and based on that evidence, the trial of this case begins in the Chester Crown Court on May 21, 2012. Initially, 
Farzana and Iftikhar continue to deny their involvement in their daughter's murder. But when Farzana begins to suspect that she is being framed for her own daughter's murder, she finally accepts in court on July 9, 2012, that Shafilea Ahmed's murder was not committed by anyone else, but by Iftikhar Ahmed himself. In her statement, Farzana also reveals that she tried to stop Iftikhar, but instead, Iftikhar beat and threatened her family, saying, if any of you ever talk about this to anyone, your fate will be just like Shafilea's. Now, two witnesses had testified against Iftikhar Ahmed. Besides, the police who gather evidence also indicate that it was Iftikhar Ahmed who murdered Shafilea, then threw her body far into the jungle. However, a natural disaster struck that area, and with the floodwaters, Shafilea's body drifted and reached the riverbank on its own. After a lengthy trial in August 2012, Farzana and Iftikhar are found guilty of murdering their own daughter and disposing of her body after the murder. They are then sentenced to 25 years each. It is also proven in court that this was an honor killing. Following this verdict every year on July 14th, Shafilea Ahmed's birthday, the National Day of Memory for Victims of Honor Killings, is observed in her memory. So with this, the case of Shafilea Ahmed comes to a close. However, perhaps nature also desired that Shafilea Ahmed receive justice and her killers be punished. Therefore, albeit late, Shafilea's parents, her murderers, are also sentenced. If you appreciate our efforts, like and share this video, if you haven't subscribed, do so now. Thank you.